Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. We've been talking about relationships. I believe that this is session number eight on relationship recovery. I know there are some relationships that you don't want recovered, uh, but this is recovery of the right relationships. It's how to uh, be like God, walk in grace, walk in humility, and have friends. And what we've discovered over the years is most Christians have a lot of acquaintances, but they don't really have a lot of friends. And the reason is because a friend is somebody that you really trust. A friend is somebody that you can tell a secret to, and it's not on Twitter in the afternoon. A, a friend is somebody that you can tell what's going on in your life, and they don't try to counsel you in order to use it to their own advantage. To take advantage of your situation, but they come at you and do it as, as a friend. You know, it's been said that, you know, enemies will stab you in the back, but your friends stab you in the chest while they're looking at you and smiling. A good friend of mine, and uh, some of you know this, but he was uh, Attorney General of the United States of America. And shortly right after 9-11, uh, Loretta and I were asked to go to his office in Washington, D.C., to the Justice Department which that was a lot of fun getting in there right after 9-11, and uh, do a Bible study for his staff. So here we are, we're in Washington, D.C. We're in the Attorney General of the United States office doing a Bible study. He had about eight staff members there. And uh, it was kind of interesting. He asked them if they had memorized their scripture. Now, in most churches, you know, you memorize a scripture and you're talking about a verse. The scripture he was talking about was an entire chapter in the book of Psalms. And, and they kind of, you know, tucked their heads. And he said, well, just in case you didn't remember your assignment, he passed out sheets with uh, that entire psalm on it. And he, he read it with everyone, but he didn't use a sheet. He had the entire chapter memorized. Like I say, this is the Attorney General of the United States. So... Everybody left, and Loretta and I are there with him uh, in his office having a couple of private moments, and he had a, a couple of personal pr prayer requests he wanted us to pray with him about. And then I asked him, I said, uh, is this what you thought it would be? Is this what you thought it would be? Because years, years, many years before he was ever up there, uh, we were down here at the Lake of the Ozarks sitting in my office, and uh, he had pulled up to my office in a I think it was a 1968 Chevrolet, had a little bit of rust around the trunk, and I'll never forget where the key goes in the trunk, the key thing had been knocked out, and he had a coat hanger holding the trunk down. So I wouldn't say that he came from a background of a lot of money, okay? So, but uh, when he was in my office, uh, I looked at him, and I said, you know, one of these days you're going to be in Washington, D.C., and you're going to be a man of power. He said, well, you know, I'm just working on Missouri right now. And, uh, but at any rate, I asked him, uh, is this what you thought it would be? Is, is this what you thought it would be? And he kind of sunk down in his chair, and he said, uh, I knew when I came to Washington, D.C., he said, I, I, I knew this that your enemies are out to get you. Your enemies are waiting for that moment that you turn away so they can stab you in the back. You have a lot of enemies here. He said, but I had a lot of friends. He said, but the thing that bothered me and bothers me more than anything is when my friends betray me. And he says, and that's happened a lot. And you're talking about a man who Every morning at 8.30 when the president's in town, every morning at 8.30 before his staff Bible study, he met with the president for half an hour, every morning. And then walked the underground tunnels and came back over to his office. So when it comes to relationships, 
you may be thinking, if I could just attain a certain level of status, then my relationships would level out. But I think what we need to understand is the greater status you attain, the more people will want to use you and manipulate you, and they become what, we've heard this term before, fair-weather friends. Everything's going good and you're riding high and they're right there with you because they want to ride on your coattails. But when things start going south, so do they. And betrayal is... uh, is a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. We, uh, the most devastating financial situation that I've ever been in my life was uh, my family. We had a, a factory. We had a factory in another state and uh, had several hundred employees and we put a man in charge of the factory that we trusted. He was a friend. And he embezzled $140,000 a month for two years before it was caught. And when it was caught, it was like almost too late. The vultures were waiting at the door. And I'll never forget uh, this man who has passed and my dad who has passed. They were what I would call best friends. And my dad... Uh, and our family was the owner of the factory. And uh, my dad had actually given this man 10% ownership if he would oversee it. And he, over, he oversaw it. He, he did well for himself. To the point of basically bankrupting the factory. And we came out of it, and, and I'm still alive, and I'm here. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of times when you don't think you're going to make it. How many of you have ever had a time in your life when you didn't think you were going to make it? Okay, now look at your hand you got up. It's attached to your arm. It's attached to your body. That means you made it. You're here. You survived. Okay? But sometimes it's just the grace of God that got you through everything. It's God's power. It's not the power of your friends. Friends are good. We need friends. And the Bible says if you want to have friends, you need to show yourself friendly. And that's in context of what you, what you get is what you give. In Luke 6.38 where Jesus said, Give and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you give, let's put it this way, in the same way, in the same measure you dish it out, it's going to be dished back to you. That's not talking about money. That principle works for money, but if you read that in context, that's talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness has to do with relationships with other people. You want to be forgiven? You need to forgive some people and quit holding on to that grudge from 30 years ago or 40 years ago. You know, like the woman that counseled with me a few years ago. Standing right back there, probably 15, 18 years ago. She said that a family member had taken her innocence away when she was a young girl. Had molested her and destroyed her from having the joy of having a wedding night. Just, And she said, I hate him, I hate him. And I said, well, where is he? And she said, he's dead. I said, well, here's what let's do. I'm going to run down to Lowe's and get a couple shovels. And we'll just go out to the cemetery and dig him up. We'll just open that box up and rattle his bones around. In fact, I'll let you just take his skull and you can throw it to me. We'll play baseball with his skull. I'll use his forearm for a bat. How's that? She looked at me. I said, okay, you're getting the picture. He may have stolen something from you, but he does not have the power to give it back. There is no way in the world he can give back to you what he stole. What you've got to do is you've got to forgive. If you go to the bank and they forgive you of a note, they say, we're going to forgive this note. What's that mean? That means that that 
That note no longer exists. They forgave it. You, you need to forgive your uncle. She said, but he's dead. I said, it's not about him, it's about you. His life's not being messed up because of you hating him. I mean, he's either in heaven or someplace else, but wherever he is, he's not being affected by how you feel, but you are being affected by how you feel. It's destroying your life. You're waking up every morning. You're coming in this church, crabby old woman. Sour old look on your face scares me to look at you. I don't know if to say hello, you're going to hit me or what. And that's the way she was. Kind of mean. She wasn't mean. She had a good heart. But boy, that hatred came across that way. But when she let it go, oh my goodness, she changed. And then her relationships with other people like me and other people changed. Because hatred and unforgiveness can, can put a look on you that you don't even know you have. And sometimes you've had that look for so long, you think it's you. You think it's you. It's not you. It's the devil. So if we want to have good relationships, we discovered back eight sessions ago, the very first thing you've got to do is you've got to get your relationship straight with God. And then you've got to get the relationship straight with yourself. See, she blamed herself for what happened. She blamed herself. Well, maybe we just need to quit playing the blame game. Quit trying to figure out who did it wrong, you know. You can stand around for a half an hour trying to figure out who broke something. Hello, let's just fix it. It doesn't really matter. It does to God, but as far as we're concerned, it's not really about who broke it. It's how can we allow the Holy Spirit to fix it? And sometimes, you know, that scripture, what you give is what you receive, you know, with the same measure you dish it out, it gets dished back to you. It's, it's that way with forgiveness. You're wondering why your family's holding resentment against you? Well, let me ask you something. Are you holding resentment against them? Are, are you, you're wondering why they don't open up the doors to their heart. Have you opened up the doors to your heart? And see, what happens here is you start looking at somebody else's heart and comparing. And, uh, you know, that, that's a bad place to be. Let's take a look at a scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. I know we've looked at it once, but we're going we're gonna to be a little deeper today. How do you like my tie? You like my tie? You guys like it? Is this a good Iowa tie? Yeah, all right. How come you guys are down here in Missouri? Is it because all the Democrats are up there? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Air Force? My dad was in the 8th Air Force in World War II. The Normandy Division. Yeah. Air Force, yes. All right, praise God. No, I, I'm, I don't mean to pick on Republicans or Democrats, you know, because the Bible even says that Jesus met with the Republicans and the sinners. So, or no, that was the publicans, the publicans. They hadn't been re for a while. You know, I guess once you're a publican and then you become a publican again, you're a Republican. I don't know. You know, a guy told me one time, he said, this country, one of these days, is going to be ruled by the Democrats. I said, you're absolutely right. One day after the rapture. <laughs> I'm just teasing y'all. I'm not going to let you know my political affiliation. Yeah. Yeah. But whatever story you come up with, I can trump it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Okay. Well, you know, one guy said he's coming back with Jesus. I was reading the scripture the other day. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. 
with the voice of the trump. <laughs> then you turn the page. <laughs> it. <laughs> well, praise God. It's okay to have fun, isn't it? See, and there are people who will hate me because of what I just said. And see, here's, here's where my relationship works out. I don't hate them. And we got to quit being haters. I said, we got to quit being haters. Republicans have got to quit hating Democrats, and Democrats have got to quit hating Republicans. You know, you can have your opinion and your, 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 your thoughts, but fight it out in the ballot box. Don't fight it out in the streets, you know. Are you, are you okay with that? All right. You love me still? That's 80%. Okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not. Okay, now, if you read this in the original Greek, and we have a Greek scholar back in the sound booth. He can correct me on this. Uh, he usually does. Um, for we, <laughs> for we, he's my good friend, by the way. For we dare not compare ourselves. In other words, you don't dare do this. In the original language, that means don't do this. We dare not class ourselves. Now, you can put yourself in a class. Did you know that? You can say, okay, I'm in this class, or I'm in this class. We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves. Now, in order to compare, there has to be someone you're comparing to. Are you following me here? And this can be the death of a friendship. This is the reason a lot of people don't have friends, is they spend their lives comparing. Well, I don't want to be a friend with this person because they don't know as much about the Bible as I do, and I just always end up ministering to them. Wouldn't that be nice to have somebody you could practice on all the time? Some demon-possessed person you could practice casting out demons with? I mean, you know, wouldn't it? Okay. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those. Those who? Those who commend themselves. Now, the... Uh, <laughs> What does that word commend mean? What, what does that mean? Well, I wasn't quite sure either. So I looked it up in the dictionary to just be sure. Commend. Who is someone who commends themselves? What, what does that mean? It means either formally or officially they give praise. So don't compare yourself with someone or don't class yourself with someone who either formally, officially, publicly, or privately praises themselves. Have you ever been around people that it's, it's all about them? Their favorite song, every, Ryan, everyone has a favorite song. Some people's favorite song, it's all about me, myself and me, can't everyone see the world is about me? All right. To commend means to give praise. Now, to commend yourself means to praise yourself. To come compliment yourself, to congratulate yourself, to applaud yourself, to cheer, to toast, to salute yourself. Your favorite friend is a mirror. You love yourself, you know, the Bible says to love yourself, but that's talking about in a good way. You love yourself so much that if anybody else fell in love with you, You'd get jealous. <laughs> Do not compare yourself with those kinds of people. Because they see themselves so high, you'll never meet the standard. You'll never meet the standard. 
But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. I knew a lady one time who was a musician, and she set up fake accounts on Twitter and Facebook and other social media, and then emailed herself compliments. And then published them. And I think she believed them. See, you can get caught up in yourself so much that you don't, you don't have room for anybody else in your life. You say, well, what, what's this got to do with Christianity, with spirituality? What, what are you trying to tell us? Is, is this just some kind of a social class? No, here's the deal. You are the spokesman for Jesus here on this earth right now. According to Jesus, our Father who art where? In heaven. God is in heaven. Jesus said, I'm going to go and be with the Father. When Stephen was being stoned, he looked up and he saw Jesus in heaven, standing at the right hand of the Father. But we know that God is a three-part being. He is, he is Father, Son, the Word, and Holy Spirit. We are created in His likeness. First uh, Thessalonians 5.17 says, we are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. We're created in His image. But with God, now, now take this literally. Jesus and the Father are in heaven. Are we in heaven? No, we are on earth. But Jesus said this. He said, when I go to be with the Father, the Father is going to send His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in my name to be here with you. And He's going to be here till He comes, until Jesus comes back. Jesus left. Has he come back yet? No. How do we know that? All the Republicans are still here. <laughs> I just couldn't. It, it sounded too funny to not say it. And you know, because we have fun laughing, there will be people who will be watching this DVD or whatever, and they'll get mad. You know, can't, can't we be honest with each other? Sometimes we become so politically correct that we're nauseating. I mean, you can't say anything about anybody at all. Now, I'm Swedish, Okay. You say, well, Swedes have never been persecuted. You know, when I was in high school, they used to call me the tall, dumb Swede. <laughs> Along with some other things. <laughs> All right. Here's the deal. Jesus hasn't come back yet. So using Ozark language, you can understand this, you'll have to interpret since you're from Iowa. Uh, using Ozark language, if Jesus was here and he left, and he hasn't come back yet, he's still there. Got that? Okay. Air Force, got that? Right. Now, so we right here on this earth as the church, we are, what's the Bible call us? We are the body of Christ. We are the functioning part of God. We're not gods, but don't you know that your temple is the temp, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the God of the ages lives inside of you if you're born again? So you have the Lord living inside of you in the form of the Holy Spirit. So the Father and the Son are in heaven, but the Holy Spirit is here on the earth. Where? In us. In us. Look at your hands. At 3 a.m. late one night, Norval Hayes, we're sitting in a hotel room, and he said, Son, look at your hands. I looked at my hands. He says, What do you see? I said, I see my hands. He said, No, you see the hands of Christ. He said, If Jesus is going to lay hands on somebody, he's going to use your hands. If he's going to anoint with somebody with oil, he's going to use your hands. You are the body of Christ here on this earth. And the Holy Spirit works through you to do the work of the Lord. 
Now here's the deal. If everybody hates you, you have no relationships, everybody thinks that you're dumb and whatever and you're crazy and you're a lunatic and nobody will listen to you, how many people do you think are going to get ministered to by you? Now, the Bible, and we went through this last week, it's, it says in the Bible, remember the Bible? It says, as much as possible, which means it's not always possible. It says, but as much as possible, have a good relationship with people. As much as possible. Why? Because you may be called on to minister to that person. And if they think you're a jerk because you have no relationship skills that the Bible tells us about, they're not going to call for you. How many people can you minister to? Well, you know, it's, my dad was a great businessman. And uh, one of his friends came in one day and said, Hey, Raymond, uh, how about giving me a discount on this power boat? Oh, one thing that my dad always, I liked, people say, uh, what's the price of that boat? And, and Dad would say, uh, well, that depends. How much discount do you want? <laughs> yeah, that was one of his lines. But they would come in and he'd say, how much is this boat? And Dad would give them a price. And they'd say, uh, wait a minute, Raymond. Come on. Hello. I'm your friend. I'm your friend. You know, you need to give me a discount. You can sell it to me at cost, because why? I'm your friend. Dad says, no, I have to sell it to you at full retail. Because, because you are my friend. Because what you need to understand is my enemies don't come in. <laughs> I don't sell boats to my enemies. I only sell boats to my friends. i got to make money off you. Well, it's kind of the same principle. You want to minister to somebody? You need to show yourself friendly. You need to be approachable. You need to be like Jesus. Now, not everybody liked God. I mean, God was the pastor of heaven, and one-third of his congregation put it in B for boogie and left. What did God do wrong? Nothing. You're going to have people that won't be friendly with you. You're going to have people that you cannot connect to. And you can, you, don't do this. Don't play the blame game. Don't say, oh, I wonder what I did wrong. Well, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe it's just them that's a jerk. And there are people, if, if you're not watchful, and if you're not led by the Holy Spirit in your relationships, there can be people who will spend their entire lives wasting your time, your entire life. They can be plants of the enemy. As I, I, I'm not sure where this scripture is, but you, it's someplace, Hezekiah, I think, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. <laughs> Sir, we read it a few weeks ago. Remember, I'm bringing your memory back here now. It said, avoid such men as these. There's certain people. There are certain people you're not supposed to hang around with. This missionary dating stuff does not work. All right? So, let's take a look at the scripture again. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. If it's not wise, it's what? The opposite of wisdom in the Bible is foolishness. It's foolish. And what's the Bible say about fools? Other than the fact that you're not supposed to be the judge and call him a fool, but you know what? Don't let that scripture about not judging get out of context in your life. Because when the Bible tells you to avoid a fool or to hang, not hang around with people who are not wise or to not associate with perverts or something, how are you going to know that they are what they are unless you judge their lifestyle? And there's going to have to be a certain amount of looking at and determining and maybe we should call it that way. There are some things you will have to determine. Now, you are not to judge, convict, condemn, and sentence. But you have to, you have to judge whether some guy is, is right for your daughter to go out with on a date. I had a daughter. 
guy comes up and he says, I want to date your daughter. I said, okay, let me ask you a couple questions. Do you have a car? Do you have a job? And are you going to ask me for money? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, sayonara. I told my daughter, I said, I will never, I will never tell you who to date or who not to date. I told her that. And uh, she's, uh, I believe she's in Tulsa today, but she was a, a very sweet girl when she was in high school. She was like Miss Hillbilly Queen. I mean, she was a pretty girl. But she only went out on one date that I know of in high school. Just one date. Um, and she was very studious, too. She graduated from Camdenton with a 4.4, 4, 4.5 grade point average or something. But she came home one day, and she loves mathematics. In fact, that's what her college degree is in, is mathematics. And uh, she came home and from this date, and I said, how was the date? And she said, it, it was good. And I said, uh, so do you like him? Oh, he, yeah, he's, he's okay. I said, do you, are you going to go out with him again? She goes, no way, Dad. And she gave me one of those, you know, blonde girl looks. Excuse me. See, right there. <laughs> Everybody that's blonde. Every, oh, just cut that out and put that on Facebook. Got a preacher in Missouri. He thinks all blonde people are going to hell. I heard him say it in a sermon. No, I'm, come on. Let's lighten up, folks. Let's don't be so politically correct. You know, whether your hair is black or, or white or, or shiny. <laughs> Reflective. <laughs> okay, so I said, I said, uh, are you going to go out with a with him again. And she goes, no way, Dad. No way. I said, did he do something inappropriate? You know, here's, here's Dad. Did he do something inappropriate? She goes, no, Dad. I said, well, why aren't you going to go out with him again? She said, well, we got to talking, and he doesn't even know his square root tables. <laughs> I said, Sherry, you just eliminated every boy in Camden County. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, nobody knows their square root tables. Yeah. So I told her, but I told her, I said, I'm never going to tell you who you can date or who you can't date. And so uh, she brought a friend home from college when she was a freshman. And uh, there's a couple other kids with them, four of them, but one of them she kind of liked and she was thinking about dating him. And I remember when I took her around the corner and I said, Sherry, I need to talk to you for just a second. I said, you remember back when you were a little girl and I told you I would never tell you who you could date or who you couldn't date? She goes, yeah, Dad, I remember that. I said, well, I just want you to know something. I lied. <laughs> uh, because that guy is never stepping foot on our property again alive. Well, what happened? I judged him. But no, I didn't condemn him or whatever. But sometimes you have to make some decisions. And don't let somebody say, well, don't judge. No, you're making judgments every day about everything. And maybe we shouldn't call it judging. You need to make quality decisions. And you need to make quality decisions in who you hang around. Now, it doesn't mean you can't work at a store that has lost people in it. Doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean you can't go down and work for Marriott Hotels because Marriott Hotels are owned by the Mormons, or you can't work for Pepsi Cola because they're owned by the Mormons, or what? You, you can't. No, that's not what we're talking about. Because Jesus said in John chapter 17, if you'll read this story, which is what I call the Lord's Prayer, the actual Lord's Prayer, where Jesus spends a whole chapter talking with the Father, and he says, Father, I pray that you not. Take them out of the world. When I read that, I thought, oh my gosh, what's he talking about here? Not take them out of the world, but I ask that you leave them in the world. 
Well, that's kind of the opposite of what we say sometimes. You know, if, if we could just have a little village and there's nobody but Christians in it, you know, what would we be? Amish? I don't know. What, we, what would we be? Uh, Mennonite? Why would Jesus... Now, Jesus went on to say, he said, I do not want them to be of the world, but they need to be in the world. If we pulled all the Christians out of all the non-Christian places, who's going to witness to these people? People need to be witnessed to. And one of the best witnessing tools you can have is your personal lifestyle of having a personality that has the right kind of attitude with it. People can see who you hang out with and who you don't hang out with. And even if you have to, because of a work situation, you have to hang out with somebody that's not quite right, they can see how you handle it. At the water cooler, I've seen this happen many times over the years. Uh, You know, our family had a boat dealership, actually still does. My mom turns 90 next week or later this month. And she's, you know where she is today? After church today, after teaching her Sunday school class, she's going to the dealership. My mama, 90. But I've seen it around the water cooler. You get a bunch of people around the water cooler, especially men, and somebody's always got to tell that nasty joke. Somebody's got to tell that joke that's just off color. Well, maybe you're the only Christian there. Maybe there's another Christian there. And... uh, the way you react. Now, look, let's get real. Unless the Holy Spirit guides you, and He might. But don't be the guy that says, I curse you in the name of Jesus. I curse those words. I cast them to the ground. I command you words, go back to hell from whence you came. Devil, I bind you. You're, you're going to be standing at the water cooler all by yourself. <laughs> Nobody's around. Nobody's listening. And you're going to be labeled Mr. Demon Guy. And people are just going to make fun of you. But I'll tell you what you can do. When, it's, when they tell that joke, you're not the guy that laughs or smiles or nods and says, that was really funny. You're the guy who just politely doesn't react. You think, well, what's that accomplish? That just lets them know that that's not your type of entertainment. And let that happen two or three times. And they'll quit telling that when you're up there. You say, well, they're still telling it. Yeah, but not when you're at the water cooler. Well, what does that accomplish? It just lets you know that they know that you have a more holy, higher standard not because you're comparing yourself with them. No, that's just, that's not your standard. That's not who you are. You're not Mr. Pervert, you know. You're not Epstein. You're, you're, not, you're not that guy. So, if you have that reputation of being... the clean person at your business, where you work, wherever. It could be a service business. It doesn't matter what kind of business it is. In times of trouble, they'll come to you. you got a guy laying in the gutter with a 9 millimeter hole in his stomach. Late at night, at midnight, the bar is closing And his blood's running into the gutter. He's not going to call for the bartender. He's going to call for that person he knows. You say, does that really happen? Yeah, that really does happen. It really happens. Had a, I should have brought it down here, but I've got this huge Bible. Sonder de Shera. Bless her heart. She gave me a Bible the other day because she knows I collect old Bibles. And this thing is from back in the early 1800s. 
but it's in perfect condition. It is so precious. And uh, she asked me if I had one like it, and I didn't recognize that I had one similar, but the one that I have that's similar looks older, but it's actually five or ten years newer, and it's not as in good a condition. I mean, actually, that Bible she gave me was just, I've got it sitting in my office. I, I just, I love the Word of God. And just to think that back in the 16, 17, 1800s, you know, these Bibles were on the, almost printed individually. I mean, there's just, and the, the covers on them are like a quarter of an inch thick. Graphics, just really nice. But here's the thing. I have another Bible that's similar to the one she gave me. It's, I could say, five or ten years newer, and it's not as in good a condition. But let me tell you the story of that Bible. There's a guy down here at the Lake of the Ozarks who uh, he collects books and sells them. And what he does is he goes to garage sales, or he did. He, he went to garage sales, and he would find books. And he would just, old books, he just, people say, here they are, they're a dollar a piece, whatever. And he would buy them. Well, he bought this sack of books, a big grocery bag full of old books. And uh, he I forget where he bought them, but he came back to his place here in Osage Beach. He was connected with the marine business. And uh, he was taking the books out of this sack. And he would reach in the sack and he'd take out a book. And he'd reach in the sack and take out a book. And he finally got down to the bottom. And in the, at the bottom, there was this big family, old, kind of little ratty, but fairly good shape. The, the cover was loose, that type of thing. But it was a Bible. And he, now this guy, according to his own words, well, I won't say his own words. <laughs> he can't say his own words. Uh, let's just put it this way. He was lost. He knew nothing about Christianity, knew nothing about Jesus. He's just lost. He reaches in to get the book and when he gets the book, electricity goes through him to the point where he thought he was maybe being electrocuted or something. And he lets go of it. Now, he, I don't think he knew it was a Bible at the time. And he, and this guy's probably in his 40s, manager of a major marine dealership. It kept shocking him. So he looks in the sack and he sees it's a Bible. Now, what's a lost person do when they see a Bible and it's shocking them? They start thinking, who do I know that knows anything about Bibles or what Bibles are connected to, God and heaven and hell or whatever, that I can ask about this? Well, at our marine dealership, all the way back to 1965, January 1st of 1965, when my dad and I started it, every morning we opened the business with prayer. All right, Employees that want to could come in if they didn't want to. And to this very day, my 90-year-old mother opens a business every day with prayer. So when we would go to the boat shows, like in the Kansas City Boat Show at the H. Robardo Complex, when we'd go to the boat show, each morning before the boat show would open, we would get the employees, the salespeople, and, and, and the shop guys and everybody who was there, we would just kind of like stand in a circle, and uh, somebody, my dad or myself or my mom or somebody, would lead in a, a prayer. Now, my parents, they're good Baptist people. My, my dad's gone on to be with the Lord, but they're good Baptist people. And I used to be the pastor of a Southern Baptist church at one time. I'm not ditzing Baptist in any way, but let's just put it this way. They are not necessarily going to be praying in tongues or casting out demons or having a Pentecostal type prayer. It's going to be very calm and collected. And Father, as we start this day, I ask that you be with us. And safety over all of our people. You know, that type of thing. Just a very calm, collected. But they did that every morning before the boat show started. Well, this guy was also in the boat show. For years, he was in the boat show. And he would see our dealership 
holding hands and having prayer. Well, he probably thought we were Looney Tunes, you know, that we were out of our gourds, you know, some kind of Christian fanatics or something. But nevertheless, he saw it. So when he found the Bible that was electrified and he wanted to find out about it, he put it back in the sack and he drives 50 miles over to see my mom to ask her if this is what Bibles do. (laughs) Because he didn't know. And so she says, well, and she, she told him, she's, she's a Baptist. She, she talked to him in kind of a very normal way. And she told him it was the word of God. And, and uh, he said, well, do you know of anybody I can give this to? And she said, well, you know my son, Larry. Uh, he's, he started a church over in Osage Beach. And, uh, you know, you could maybe donate it to his church or give it to him or something. Or, or maybe he could help you out with this. Because my mom knew, now she's Baptist, but she knew when it came to casting out demons, that was like saying, sick him to a dog to me, man. I was just like, you know, I'm not a, I have authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing by show any means harm me. And, you know, you know, it's like, devil, give it your best shot. Because no matter what your best shot is, my shot's better. I don't care what your shot is, devil. I don't care what it looks like. I walk by faith and not by sight. I go by what God says instead of what I see. It doesn't matter what the destruction looks like. You can be a a 38-foot Goliath. It doesn't matter if I'm a little kid with a slingshot. My slingshot trumps your height. (laughs) So he came over to my office. And he came in my office. And we took out the Bible. And after a little while, he got saved. So, you know, it's cool. He got saved. And so you say, well, then what happened? Well, then he started going to church here. And until the day that they moved away, that uh, whoever owned the marina that he was managing sold it and they moved or whatever, he was here. Came here for quite some time. Now, if you kind of weave all that story together, It does matter when you go into a restaurant and you bow your head and pray. Now, you don't have to be like Smith Wigglesworth and jump up on the table and com- command the demons of you know, calories out of the food and all that kind of stuff. No, I'm just saying, just, you walk into a restaurant and you see a couple people sitting there, a couple men, a man and a woman, two women, a family, whatever, you see them sitting there and for just maybe 30 seconds they have their heads bowed. You have respect. You know that they're praying. I mean, even lost people know you're praying. A waitress can come up and just lost her in a goose, but she'll stand there while you pray because she knows you're praying. You say, well, what good does that do? Well, other than the fact that you blessed your food and you were showing love to the Lord, it's a witness. Your relationships with the people in the world and with people in the church and with yourself, if you've got your relationship with God's straight, I think you would be shocked at how many people would would come to you with a question. A friend of mine who was, uh, he was in the cabinet of Ariel Sharon. This guy, his dad led the raid on Entebbe, and they have statues for this guy's, I'm talking about his dad in Israel. He lives in Israel, in, in Tel Aviv. He's a Jew. He's a very close friend of mine. His position on Ariel Sharon's cabinet was that he was in charge of Jewish Christian relations. It was a new thing. It was a new thing with Ariel Sharon. They'd never had this position on the cabinet before. They'd finally begin to figure out that not all Christians wanted to put him in the gas chambers. There were some Christians that loved him. All right? So this guy was my friend. I've had people who I have known for years who right off the bat said, did you get him saved? Well, I can guarantee you when I met him, and I met him at uh, the Hyatt Hotel in Washington, D.C. at a Billy Bram prayer conference, and uh, if I would have come up to him, have you ever considered being a Christian? Or anything like that in the beginning, we would have never been friends. We became friends, and we were friends for almost, 
I would say, at this particular time, about 10 years. Well, he comes to the United States quite often. He's in his probably early 50s right now, mid-50s. But he would, he would come to the United States, and he loved to fly. He'd rent a little Piper four-seat plane, and he would rent it out in Shawnee Mission, and, and he would get some hours in because, you know, you can fly an hour in one direction in Israel, and you're in another country. You know, you fly for an hour in Missouri, you're still in Missouri, you know, or whatever. So uh, he would come over here and, and fly. That was something he enjoyed doing. Well, he called me up one day, and he said, uh, can I meet with you, just have lunch? I said, sure. So he flew in to Osage Beach just to have lunch. That was it. We we're going to have lunch. He's going to leave. So we went to a local restaurant and had lunch. We're sitting there talking about the conditions, the political climate in Israel and that type of thing. And then he says to me, he said, you know, we've been friends for 10, 12 years, whatever it was. He said, and you've never tried to convert me. And he said, and I'm not wanting to get converted right now or anything like that. But he said, one thing that's always puzzled me is Christians believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, we're waiting for the Messiah to come. You guys believe he's already come and that it, and that it was Jesus. Just out of curiosity, and follow me, why do you guys believe that? door open well if I would have started giving him scriptures out of the New Testament that would be like a Mormon trying to convert me by reading out of the Book of Mormon I don't believe the Book of Mormon is of God any more than a DC comic book is and so you can't convince me that Mormons are okay by reading to me out of the Book of Mormon well I wouldn't have been able to convince him that Jesus was okay by reading to him out of the New Testament because he doesn't believe the New Testament is real, okay? So I just started out in Isaiah chapter 53 and started going through some of the Old Testament prophecies. And, and he was saying things like, oh my, that's just exactly what happened to Jesus. Interesting. Now, did he get saved that day? I don't think so that day. Do I believe he is now? Yes, I do. But sometimes, you know, you, you, you have to take things step by step. And there's a lot of people, if you develop your friendships properly, you can get them saved. And uh, why would Jesus be con concerned about our friendships. Why? Why would, he, why would he even care? Why would the Bible say, if you want to be, have friends, show yourself friendly? Why doesn't the Bible just say, you don't need friends? Why? Because there is an element of communication, and this may seem so unspiritual to some people, but I'll tell you what, if, if we could be the kind of people, personality-wise and friendship-wise, and that doesn't mean let people walk all over you. It doesn't mean to let yourself be abused. I'm just telling you right now, if you're a woman and your situation is that your husband comes at you with a ball bat and, and beats on you, foolishness would be to stay. I'm not, don't allow yourself to be abused either physically or verbally. Don't, don't allow that. But, you know what I'm talking about. You can't use somebody else's craziness to alter your personality to where you use what they have done to you in life and that affects what you do to other people. You know, most psychologists know this, that uh, abused people abuse people. That's why you got a guy that beats his wife, probably his daddy beat his mom. That's because people pick up what they're around. And with this closing statement, what are people picking up from you?
What are people picking up from you? There's a guy working in the sound room over here, for those of you who don't know, under that monitor over there to your left. That whole room back in there is a sound. Not the video department, it's in another room, but, but the sound department's back there. And I don't know if he's back there today or not, but Larry Gaddy is a, a very dear friend of mine. And he, to this day, he owns a marina here at the Lake of the Ozarks. And over the years, there was times when he was president of the Lake of the Ozarks Marine Dealers Association. There's times when I was president of the Lake of the Ozarks Marine Dealers Association. And the Marine Dealers Association every year had a big Christmas party for all the marine dealers. It wasn't really a, so much of a Christmas party as what it was, let's all get together and get drunk and use Christmas as the excuse. Uh, dub in some laughter on that. The... Uh, but as a leader of the organization, even though we weren't the ones that planned the event, you know, uh, you're president of the Marine Dealer Association, you're not the dictator. You know, you're, you moderate the meetings, but everybody else decides what goes on. So they set up their uh, Christmas parties at Tantara, and I guess it's Margaritaville now, and Lodge of Four Seasons and places like that. And uh, I will never forget, uh, Loretta and I would go, and... We would drink uh, iced tea or water and, and not make a big deal out of it. You know, we didn't walk up to the, to the liquor bar and go, ick, ick, and, you know, and, and, and all that. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying, because I want to have the mind of Christ, I don't drink. I don't want anything that alters my thinking. Anything that alters my thinking is a tool the devil can use. So I don't want anything. I, I, don't, I've, I went through the hippie era, but I never used drugs. I've never been drunk in my life. I've never smoked a cigarette. I pretended to a lot. Me and Bill Clinton had a lot in common in that area. I just never inhaled. But, but I'll never forget, Loretta and I felt like we were the only ones at the Marine Dealers Association who didn't drink. We felt like we were the only ones, you know, because we got our glass of water, and of course, everybody else probably thought it was, what, what is a clear one? Vodka? Is that the clear one? Or I don't know. Whatever the clear one is, you know, they probably, and they thought, man, they're drinking a lot of that. How many of you know? Jerry, you should know. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, but whatever the clear one is, I don't know. But the whole thing is, Larry Gotti came up to me. I remember Larry and Carol. We're probably talking 30 years ago. You know, they came up to me and they said, uh, you noticed you guys aren't drinking, you know, liquor. And I said, yeah. You know, didn't make any big deal out of it. And he says, me neither. We became friends. You know, it's, it's interesting. People who want to be right will seek out other people who want to be right. And it's kind of nice when you can find somebody, you know, of like mind. But if you blend in with the world, if I would have said to Loretta, hey, Loretta, look, we're Christians and all that kind of stuff, but just this one night, it's not, let's don't make a big deal out of it. Everybody will be talking. If, if we go out there and say, well, you don't drink, or what, what, you know, it's going to make a big deal. So, you know, you don't have to drink it, but at least get some and carry, walk it around and whatever, you know. Just look like you fit in. If we would have done that, I don't know if I would have ever had a relationship with Larry Gowdy. Wow. All right. Did you learn anything today? You learn anything that can help you with your relationships with other people. You know, you've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. You know, you meet somebody, don't just say, yes, I'll go to your dinner party, or no, I won't go. Pray about it. Say, Father, guide me by your Holy Spirit. Is this somebody you want me to connect with? You know, and whether you're young or old, I tell you what, in school, if kids in school, you know, my mama used to say, if all the other kids jumped off the cliff, would you jump off the cliff? I said, well, it depends on which kids it was. 
you know. <laughs> I mean, that's the mindset we have sometimes. It all depends. We're want, we all want to fit in. We all want to be liked. I said we all want to be liked. That's when you're supposed to say, we, le- we really like you, Pastor. <laughs> oh, we're up to 75% now. That's good. I love you guys. Let's stand. We have ministry in the lighthouse. Uh, If you're not born again and you'd like to be born again, today is your day. If you're born again and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, today is your day. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. Teach us through your word. We want to be... Your son, Jesus, said, you are the light of the world. He said... Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and the result will be that they will glorify you, Father, in heaven. We proclaim that today in the name of Jesus. Amen.